BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 231, Depression and Antidepressant Medications. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Brett Newcomb and this is Dr. Kathy Maupin. And today we're going to be talking about depression and antidepressants. Antidepressants is a sort of a global phrase that applies to a group of medicines that are continuing to evolve and they're used to treat a lot of different things. I mean, we, depression is a, is a big word mm-hmm. uh, and it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And, and as a counselor, I can tell you that treating people with chronic depression or clinical depression is difficult on many levels in part because it's not visible. You know, if, if you're walking around with, a, with a, a cast on your leg and hobbling, people have compassion, they see you, they open doors for you, whatever. If you're walking around depressed, after a very short period of time, even the people that love you are like, suck it up, get on with it. You know, damn it, get, you know, where's your energy? Do something. And people, yeah, sadly, with, that people is, with that's a natural reaction. Difficult, difficult depressions, even suicidal depressions, they, they are battered by that. And mm-hmm. it, accelerates and exacerbates the issues that they struggle with. So depression as a, as a treatable illness is a complex compound problem. It's mm-hmm. al- almost always comorbid. You almost always have depression with anxiety or panic attacks. One mm-hmm. suppresses the other, but they're both there. Mm-hmm. So the antidepressant drugs, there there are four classes of mm-hmm. them that have evolved so far. The, the first was what we call the MAOI inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The second evolution was a group of drugs called tricyclics. Which was like in the 60s. The third was a group of drugs called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That was the 80s. In the 80s. And the fourth is selective neurotonin reuptake mm-hmm. inhibitors. And the way they all are believed recent. to work uh, is it's a, a way to help the brain not reabsorb. In the, the brain is full of all these nerve endings, thousands and millions and millions mm-hmm. of thousands of nerve endings that are, they create what we call a synaptic cleft. The, the nerves look kind of like a, a string with a, a Y on each end that point mm-hmm. at each other. And there's an electrical chemical impulse that makes this nerve spasm. And it shakes loose little chemicals that flow out mm-hmm. into a solution. And those drift around in the solution and then become reabsorbed on the other side. That causes that balance to change and that impulse to kick. It's to, a chemical communication nerve. between the two nerves and that chemical yeah. is usually serotonin, sometimes dopamine, sometimes, sometimes norepinephrine. norepinephrine. So that pool, that solution that they swim in is the critical ingredient. And mm-hmm. all of these drugs operate in different ways on, on different uh, uh, amine uh, um, they, they the use, chains. What am I? I don't know what you're thinking, but the, but the, uh, but the nerves all use different neurotransmitters, right. which is what we call them. But once that fluid's out there, yes, then the nerve that developed that that secreted the fluid picks it back up. Right. Okay. So it reabsorbs re-uptake. it. Reuptake. So that's called reuptake. So when we talk about SSRIs, right. that's selective serotonin reuptake, reuptake inhibitors. So that means it's ba- these two nerves are bathed in the neurotransmitter longer yes. before it's re- retaken up. So you're producing the serotonin or the dopamine or the norepinephrine in these, ser- it, in specifically serotonin in these serotonin uptake re- inhibitors, but it stays there longer so it gives you more you elevation better. of mood. The more volume of those things that you have, the better you feel. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to get that balance inside the brain because there's no direct delivery method for putting the chemicals in the brain. Right. So they have to give you shots or pills. Your body has something called the blood-brain barrier. Right. So between your blood and the brain, there's a barrier and you have to, and there's only specific things that can actually transmit from your blood to your brain. It's why you don't get uh, a brain infection every time you have septicemia or an infection throughout your body. It protects us. Right. But we can't deliver drugs there except we're delivering something to make the serotonin serotonin stay there longer, but we're not delivering serotonin. Right. And and so 
they use these drugs. They, they are called antidepressant drugs, but they use them for things like panic attacks, PTSD, anorexia, bulimia. Lots of things other uh, than Parkinson's. PMS. PMS, yeah. So you may be taking an antidepressant and you do the research and find out, oh my God, it's an antidepressant, I'm not depressed. <laughs> but, but there's a whole cluster of things that they throw these drugs at. Mm -hmm. And they have concerns about side effects. Mm -hmm. And you brought to me an article from a medical journal, which mm -hmm. you, you read for entertainment, all these medical journals. <laughs> all these medical journals and, I as bring As a counselor, you. I've been meaning to talk to you about this. Yeah, I know. I know. I need to read some. This is the American Journal of <laughs> The American Journal of Psychiatry. Yeah, that's one uh, of my light favorites. reading for a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you came to me with this article, which led us to have this discussion about antidepressants and and why they choose, what they choose, what the balances are, mm -hmm. what the issues are. So, so, so the article is about antidepressants in older adults. People, the average age was seventy in this study, because oftentimes we get more and more depressed as we get older because we kind of run out of neurotransmitters. Well. This the the serotonin reuptake inhibitors and the other antidepressants don't work quite as well as we get older. They so they are looking for something that makes them work better. So they've added uh, an amphetamine called met, um, sorry methphenid, methylphenidate, which yep. is what we use for ADD. They've added that to the antidepressant, and they found that it bumps it. It makes it work better in people who are older. <laughs> Literally and speeds them up. I mean, it's, it, well, it speeds them up, but it also makes their serotonin increase and their norepinephrine, which makes their mood better. Yeah. But if you think about it, you remember in the 70s when all all the mothers, except my mother on the block, was they were all taking um, diet pills. Well, diet pills are amphetamines. And so they were, They keep you focused. They make you work hard. They, keep, they stimulate norepinephrine in your brain, and they have a mood-elevating effect. Now, these are not, not um, <clears throat> against the law. These are prescribed by a doctor. But we used a lot of them then, just like we now use a lot of antidepressants. But they had the benefit of also decreasing your appetite. So most of the women in the 70s that were uh, my mother's age were skinny because they were taking this, but they were always happy. It's kind of the Stepford wife thing, but but we're doing the same thing now. We're giving everybody antidepressants for everything. Right. And unfortunately, it doesn't make you thin. It makes you gain weight. So that's not always a good that's thing. That's one of the side effect issues with most of those types of antidepressants, all four clusters, is weight gain. But but if you're if you're older, and your antidepressant doesn't work anymore, and your doctor's switching you between antidepressants. This is, this is awesome. And I've seen a lot more patients coming in with a, a low dose of an am amphetamine with their antidepressant to help bump it so that it works better for mood. But it also helps you with weight. It also, it also just makes it work in people who it doesn't work for in mm -hmm. anymore. So that was what the article was about. That was that made me feel better because I've been doing this with patients a long time using a, a very benign time-release diet pill to add to their antidepressant so that it would work better for them. And they aren't all elderly either. Made them help help them focus, gave them energy. If and that's what I did prior to doing hormones. I don't have to do it quite so so much anymore now that I can give testosterone. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go through the different types of antidepressants okay? because the article itself is just, if, if it's not working, then try methylphenidate or some other, um, or uh, some other, anti, uh, I don't want to go through the list of amphetamines, but the other, other ADD type drugs. Uh, not instead of, but in addition to, in addition and to. a balancing effect with the drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about MAO inhibitors, uh, they were the first class of drugs that were evolved for mm -hmm. the treatment of depression, but there were concerns about MAOI inhibitors, uh, MAOIs, because there were thought to be lethal problems regarding uh, food consumption. Yeah, there's a lot of foods you can't eat, and yeah. I mean a lot and, of foods you can't A lot of restrictive things. You, you can't take wine, yeah, uh, nothing, dark, dark heavy red wines, Right. you can't nothing uh, eat heavy aged. cheeses. Yeah. Uh, a lot of nuts, mm -hmm. liver. All nuts. All nuts. You can't have any nuts in anything. Chocolate. Right. So you take cheese I mean, and chocolate, chocolate out of my I diet. I mean, you know. I'm, I'm pretty restricted. <laughs> All the fun stuff. No wine. I mean, that's that's really restrictive. And then people would cheat, and then they get sick. Yes, or and they, they could didn't, die. Or they didn't know there was wine in something. Or you know, like a um, if you had a Casserole, salad dressing. Or, yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. or aged balsamic vinegar. Yes. Some of that would be uh, pre 
would be something that you could not do if so, you had a monoamine. So in doing research inhibitor. for this conversation, mm -hmm. we were looking into that, and the, the research data is now starting to break MAOIs down into two clusters, MAOA and MAOB. MAOB they're using primarily for Parkinson's symptoms, mm -hmm. but the MAOBs don't have the same food and diet restrictions. Unless you're taking awesome. an extremely high dose, mm -hmm. you, you could be taking those and you wouldn't have the worry about if you ate some cheese or had a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. But as we were looking, we weren't able to find any specific MAOB on the market for general consumption. Well, there is there is for Parkinson's, but we couldn't find it for, for as an antidepressant. So right. it must not be, I mean, I didn't go to the FDA website yet, right. but it must not be approved, but it could be used off-label. Right. If, if the only thing you could take for depression was an MAOI, mm -hmm. then you could ask for one of the uh, Parkinson's drugs off-label. It's it, it works, it's just not approved by the FDA yet for depression. So that's something that's that um, that would be helpful if that was your it's that if that's what you're taking. Yes. And that's the only thing that works. So um, usually if you're on that, nothing else is working. Right. So tricyclics, there's a lot of tricyclics out there. There's we a lot of we them. use it for chronic pain. Amitriptyline is one of them. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people on it for sleep, pain, relaxation at night before they go to sleep it's because they get anxious. Mm -hmm. So you use that, but that makes women gain weight. I don't know about men. I don't have very many men on it, but um, but in general, it makes women gain weight even at a low dose. So that's never helpful for depression mm -hmm. because that makes us more depressed when we're gaining weight. So that's the second time. So, yeah, so I'm taking something that depresses me for my depression. Right. And, uh, and all of these mess with your sex drive. They all mess all with of your them. sex drive. That's all right. of them decrease so your sex drive. that goes away, which, again, for me, is inherently depressive. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of you course know? it would be. We, well, we all like the, the high that we get from the oxytocin that we get from having sex. Right. And if we aren't getting those chemicals stirred up in our brain, then we're not getting that high. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of loss and, and there's damage to the relationship. And so, and so we're talking about antidepressants. But, but it's a very thin line. It's, it's like very, water bugs damp, dancing on you top You need to it. not be, I mean, it's never a good idea to go off your antidepressant cold turkey. So oh, we are not no, no, suggesting no, no, no. anything like this. We're just giving you enough information so that you can talk to your doctor about it and change doses, change types, change, change well, something if you're not happy. So that's a good point that we probably should expand a minute. The, when you take a new antidepressant, they will tell you to be patient. That it takes between 11 and 13 days for your metabolism to reset itself in response to this antidepressant. Mm -hmm. So they're picking at a cluster of things. Well, we'll try this for you. I've had success with teenagers taking this drug, uh, like an SSRI, like mm -hmm. Luvox or Paxil, mm -hmm. uh, Prozac. Uh, but older people, I don't want to give Prozac to. I want to give something else to. So, so they there's will, reasons because the doctors have reasons. Yeah, because the but effect, will, effects or increases norepinephrine. If you have high blood pressure, that might be a problem. I right. mean, you know, there's there's there are specific qualities for each antidepressant. So they're not just going, oh, we're just going to flip you around to some antidepressant. They have a reason that they're changing you. But it feels to the patient like they may be playing roulette. But we're you know, not. <laughs> you see, I, I take Nardil for three weeks, and I don't feel any better. Mm -hmm. So then they say, we have to wait a week to get all the Nardil out of your system, and then we'll try you on Prozac. It's a very difficult thing to find the right antidepressant And so it may people. be four or five months out, if, if I'm a, a complicated case, mm -hmm. before I'm going to feel any better by discovering the right drug. And that causes people to say, oh, antidepressants don't work for me. I can't take them. Which is another good reason to add an amphetamine because they work right away. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm not no, trying right. to push it's this, but it's a blend. They work the right away for. while you're waiting for the antidepressant to mm -hmm. start. I mean, it's very possible that that might be well, approved for other people besides people in, who are older. In the future, we should do a podcast about <laughs> taking or or returning all of your medicines because people have this this uh, magical thinking idea about keeping medicines in the medicine cabinet when they no longer take them. You know, they don't take the full dose of, mm -hmm. of their uh, antidepressants or they get changed. You know, you changed me from Benadryl to uh, something else. Mm -hmm. I put it in the medicine cabinet. Eventually, I may throw it away. It gets into the system. It gets into the groundwater. Mm -hmm. It gets into the cattle. Mm -hmm. You know, we have all these. You know, there are concerns about 
managing medicines that people don't use. And that's a podcast for another day, but especially is. with things like antidepressants. Mm-hmm. You don't want those. The or, whole or world you, to you have know, an antidepressant. You've got some and your teenager's acting funny, so you just give him one. You know, you can't Oh, well, play. that's an absolute no-no. You can't no, play no. With these things Yeah, these are not. All. And you can't go off of them. Patients will say, well. Yeah, I'm feeling should, better now. Yeah, after a month of pellets, their mood's back up because yeah. they've got their hormones back. And they're like, oh, I just stopped that, and then I felt terrible, so it must be the pellets. I'm like, yeah. you just cold turkeyed off of. Well, butrin or or one of one of the ones that requires some weaning. I remember talking to a That's family that had two two children that had ADD. <laughs> one of them was on uh, fluoxetine, and one of them was on. Uh, That's okay. A, a different, a one. different type, a different one, and they ran out of the prescription for the one, so they just gave them one of the other kids' pills. It's like no, 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 no you can't it doesn't do that. work like that. There is a reason that we choose a specific medication like this for specific people. Yeah, and we look at your whole. I mean, you should have all of your medical history Adderall. looked at. That's the one I was blanking. Well, Adderall, which is yeah. usually for adults. My son took adults. Adderall for years, but, and then he started having heart issues mm-hmm. as a response to it. So they transferred him to a different drug, mm-hmm. Focalin. He doesn't have those issues, right? But so. he may saturate on Focalin at some point. And then we'll have to mm-hmm. transfer to another. One. I mean, it is possible that you have to change from from one medication to another over right. time. But he was growing up too. Right, right, right. right. So well, as he yeah. was growing up, his his neurotransmitters were changing. So he didn't. He just didn't have the same response to that drug as he did to the focalin. Right. But one of the things that you should remember also, before before anything. Um, before you get on an antidepressant, unless it's an emergency, is that there are medical conditions that cause depression that should be ruled out before you start an antidepressant unless you're suicidal. And that is hypothyroidism. And hypothyroidism causes depression. People are very depressed on low thi- when they have low thyroid. So if you have a goiter or a thickness in your neck and your hair is falling out and you're constipated and you have no eyebrows out here, and you're depressed, that's most likely thyroid and not just not depression, good. like not making enough of the hormone in your brain. You're not making enough of the thyroid, which stimulates the hormone in the brain. So that's one. Which leads to a chemical imbalance in the brain. Right. It, and, it causes the same problem as right. depression. It's just that what's the source? And do you want to treat yes. the initial problem, which is thyroid, or do you want to treat the symptom, which is depression? Right. So the second thing is low testosterone, and that usually occurs, but not always, in women over 40, men over 50. But I'm start, I'm seeing a lot of men in their 40s with low testosterone, so it's starting to creep down to the 40. 40 that's terrible. I'm so sad that that's happening, but a lot of men right. who are younger are getting this as well. So if that's the case, then you need to replace the testosterone in the best manner that you can. I mean, there are prescriptions for men for testosterone. None for women, so we have to go to the compounding pharmacies for testosterone for women. But replacing it improves your mood. Mm-hmm. That is that's an excellent antidepressant. If that's the reason you're depressed, you should treat the treat the problem and not the symptom. Um, low cortisol, which is um, what everybody calls adrenal fatigue, that it causes depression. You don't have enough cortisol, then you can get very depressed and very well, usually you're very fatigued, like you feel like you just got wrung, wrung out, like you're just a, a, a rag that just got just wrung out and you have no energy left. That's adrenal fatigue that can cause it as well. So that has to be treated before you go on the antidepressants. And lastly, low growth hormone, which I think is what's going on with some of these older yeah. patients because I treat, test- I treat low growth hormone with testosterone because it stimulates growth hormone. And so it does it naturally without any side effects of but high that, growth hormone. That's such a politically explosive concept <laughs> to, well, to in today's marketplace is to give people growth hormones. Right. So I'm not giving them growth hormone. I'm giving them testosterone, which stimulates growth hormone. Right. Yet there, but when you get older, that doesn't work. Your pituitary doesn't keep making growth hormone because you're, you're taking testosterone. So oftentimes somebody over 70 might need to take mm-hmm. something else. Yeah. So that they're not depressed and they still ha- keep their muscle mass and they still can think. So they may have to take testosterone and a stimula- stimulation uh, medication called sermaline, which is not growth hormone. Right. But it is compounded and you can take it sublingually or as a shot and that stimulates growth hormone. And that's usually when 
for my patients, they're all on testosterone. So that's usually when the testosterone no longer is making growth hormone work. Well, Kathy, I have a concern about that because w not saying that everybody needs to go to a specialist for everything, mm -hmm. but medicating the elderly is an art form and a science. Mm -hmm. They're often, their, their metabolism slow down mm -hmm. so radically that a standard dosage for most grown-ups mm -hmm isn't metabolized in the same way. Mm -hmm. So balancing dosages for the elderly, and it's why I don't really want to play doctor anymore. I, I could do good. those things. Since you, since you don't have an MD or a DO. No, so. no, no, no. You know, I'm talking about when I was a kid and okay. they used to say you want to play doctor. Oh, that way. Uh, but learning from you, the things that you do, that you have to know, that you have to worry about, that you have to juggle, it's way more complex than I would ever want to do. I'm, I'm amazed that anybody wants to do it. But it's, it's having like, said that, find somebody that wants to do it really well. Yeah. Well, all of these things are medical things. It should be ruled out before you, you get an antidepressant handed to you. Yes. Because if you don't rule this out, then you're just treating the symptom. You're not treating the cause. And then there's going to be other things. Especially if you're middle age, And, and it's, mm -hmm. it's easy because in middle age, there are lots of life changes. Children grow up and leave home. People get divorced. Uh, retirement staring you in the face, major changes in your life, all those things can cause depression too, but so can your thyroid being out of balance, mm -hmm. so can your testosterone being and out of balance. And a lot of those things happen at the same time. adrenal glands being flooded. Absolutely. And so, again, you need to find a good doctor who will go through this process and take the time to look at what's going on in your life and going on with you to find the right answer for you. There's some psychiatrists that will go through all these hormone levels as well before yes. they put you on an antidepressant or a on a, an amphetamine. So it's not just primary care. It's not just uh, endocrinology or somebody like me, which is age management. So it's not just the, that type of doctor that does it. Psych some psychiatrists are really great at nutrition. They're really great at, at um, ruling out other illnesses before they treat. So you could pursue that right. before, before or while you're on an antidepressant to help you treat the the cause of the depression. Sometimes it's just that you don't have enough serotonin. Just like any lack of hormone, you just don't make enough. It has nothing to do with anything else. Right. And it may not have to do with your life. Your life. My favorite statement that I hear all the time is, "My life is perfect. I don't know why I feel so bad." Yeah. So I mean, if you have a perfect life, thank God. Yeah. But uh, but if that's the case, then if that depression's being treated. That could just be a genetic inherent depression, or it could be your hormones. Yeah, I hear in counseling that they they shouldn't have these bad feelings because their life is so good. Right, everything's so fine. You know, they, they do like great. comparative grief. You know, your husband died, uh, but my dog died, and I'm feeling terrible. You know, and I yeah. them, there's no should no, there, out there. You can't do comparative grief. Well, it's uh, not a contest. Your pain is your pain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nobody's. You can't compare one grief to another. I mean, no. everybody has their own. So. But but getting treatment then, yes. because a lot of general practitioners and family doctors will give antidepressants based on fluctuating symptoms in somebody's life. If mm -hmm. I'm going through a divorce, mm -hmm. I may get a low level dosage of an antidepressant I've from my regular before. doctor, and they do that, but they don't die. They don't prescribe at what we call clinical levels mm -hmm. of these antidepressants. When you they're start to level. get into more serious need states, then they're gonna refer you to a psychiatrist or somebody that specializes mm -hmm. in knowing enough about these well, medicines because they're dangerous. Everybody prescribes these serotonin yeah. uh, reuptake inhibitors because they have so few side effects. Well, but one they of the side effects for, for adolescents and children mm -hmm. is potential suicidality. Right. So, which is not a reason not to give it to them, but it's a reason to monitor them and know what you're doing. I was really talking about adults. Okay. You know, adults, I mean, oftentimes people, I mean, almost everybody who comes to my office is on an antidepressant for or one reason. Or has been on one, historically. One reason or I remember being in a teacher's lounge one time. I was doing a faculty consultation on classroom discipline, and the teachers were all sitting around having a conversation, and one of them suddenly slapped herself in the head and said, oh my God, I forgot to take my uh, Prozac. <laughs> and five, five teachers opened their purse and said, well, do you want one of mine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. That, yeah, well, that was the panacea. Yeah, yeah, everybody had, like, you know, they moved away from Valium in the, in the 60s mm -hmm. and started going into right. these. Right, so that's what, that's what led into that. Yeah. That's what led to Prozac, but, you know, they went from the amphetamines to the SSRIs, too. So we, 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 we've changed how we treat things, yeah. but, um, but the problem remains the same. Depression is a problem, and I, I can see it in people. Yes. I look, at, I look at somebody's eyes, and if their eyes don't reflect back at me, that's yeah. depression. I mean, 
it's not dry eyes. It's lights are on it's a, the home. lights. The lights yeah. aren't shining back. Yeah. And so it's funny to be able to now recognize that in people. It's, it's, it's not when they're treated. It's it's when they're not treated. Right. It's when untreated. their depression is untreated. Yes. So there are treatments. They vary in type and dosage and causation. It's not always just because there are things going on in your life that that you're depressed about it can be that, but it can also be because you have medical conditions that have led to chemical imbalances in the brain that mean that you are chemically depressed. Uh, and and we find patients that struggle with being able to admit, you know, I'm a man, I'm supposed to be tough, I'm not supposed to be depressed, that's a wuss, you know, I'll fight my way through it. You can't necessarily do that. Mm -mm. Or you can't ignore it either. I mean, yeah. really, your life, your quality of life decreases drastically, and the quality of your your family's lives decrease if you're depressed. It, it really does spread through the whole family unit or whoever you're living with. And, and what led us to this conversation today was an opportunity based on research that we had found to remind people that sometimes as you age, the antidepressant is not the only solution. You need the antidepressant, but you also need some other additive drug, that mm -hmm. typically in the speed category, the amphetamine mm -hmm. category, to find the right balance of stimulating energy while you wait on the mood to come back. Mm -hmm. And it's like a chemistry set. You need a good doctor who knows what they're doing and who will work with you and take time with you to treat your symptomology and get you better. They need them all the time. After it comes back, they leave them on their amphetamines yeah. because they find that it's much more effective. So, all right. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.